Now your spanking new Rodgers and Hammerstein album for EMI reminds us just how sophisticated, John, the musical elaborations were for the movie versions. Um, I mean, the overture main title for Oklahoma, which is featured on the album, is like a symphonic synthesis of the score, isn't it? Really? Yeah, they had these roadshow overtures, which were different from the main titles. The main titles accompanied the titles as they rode. The, the overtures um, were there to get people into their seats on the, on the road shows. Before, before the curtains before opened. The curtains I opened. used to love that when yeah. I went to the movies as a boy. <laughs> you know, Ben-Hur, the overture yeah. before yeah. The, the, the curtains yeah. went back. And, um, and what we've done here is we've uh, put the, the overture and the main title together. Um, they are more than mere amplifications of the theatre orchestrations. I mean... Orchestrations for the film of Oklahoma were done by Robert Russell Bennett, who had, of course, famously done the stage version and orchestrated that with real genius. I think it's one of the best things he, he ever did. Um, of course, the, the orchestra's bigger for, for the movie. And for the main title, Alexander Courage was drafted in because he was considered by that point to be a specialist in, in movies. And you had to captivate the audience immediately with a movie sound mm. in the overture, mm. which is why that overture sounds slightly different to the rest of the film, if you listen carefully. It's very widescreen. It is, yeah. and yet there's more of an intimate theatricality to the rest of the numbers in the film. Now, one thing that struck me straight away about this album was the immediacy of the sound. Such a faithful reproduction of the Fox soundtracks that I remember. Yeah. Is that something you really strove for, yeah. insisted upon, John? Insisted that we cram the entire orchestra into Studio 2 at Abbey Road. Not the big studio, not Studio 1. Studio 2, which is much smaller, much drier, and very, very unforgiving. And... Because the players are so marvellous, <laughs> you know, we can, they can take it. Because, you, you know, we, we, we sweated over this record. I mean, it wasn't a record that was easy to make. It was great fun and it was very satisfying to make, but we really toiled and laboured over it because we wanted to get it so right. And in that room, you have to get it right. But your reward is that you hear all the detail in that room. People make records of, of musicals and they record them in sort of Salisbury Cathedral type acoustics and, and you, you don't get any of the, the theatrical detail through. These things are written for you know, playing in dry theatres in yeah. orchestral pits. And they're so much more exciting when the detail is, yeah. you can feel you can reach out, yeah. reach out and touch it. But you really have to play. You really have to play. And I, nowhere to hide. Yeah, nowhere at all. You really hear it in the dazzling arrangement and orchestration of the carousel walls. Now I've been impressed by what your orchestra's produced with this in the concert hall. But my goodness, the uplift and fizz. Pretty plugged in, isn't it? it? I mean, really is I, on the recording. I think that's because we've played it in concerts, because we've had the experience of playing these things live and we're just about to do them on the road for 14 nights, you're sitting comfortably with the material. And so when you come to make a record, you can show it the last the extra hundred yards, you know. Mm. I remember making this record being, I wasn't a bully, I'm never a bully, but I was seeing we've got to just give more, even more than you think is needed to get this across. <laughs> Actually, the carousel stuff was the hardest stuff to play at full stop. Not only the carousel waltz, but the tuners busting out. Because it demands such rhythmic accuracy. And also anything in 3-4 time, you know, waltz, filling out the bars exact 
nicely, evenly, and not losing the lilt at the same time. That that combination of precision, but still with enough musicality for it to not sound wooden. That's tricky, but I, I think we I think we get it. I love the momentum of the Carousel Waltz. I think it, I think the tempo, which some might consider a little bit controversial, because it really moves along. Yeah, uh, I, I I mean I think people start too slowly. Yeah. Yeah, yes. and also this isn't a theatrical production of Carousel. It's a concert, yeah. and for repeated listening in a, in a sort of audio format, I think you can't labour the thing. It's a good distinction, John. Um, you you were saying the the Carousel numbers were the most challenging. It's the greatest score, isn't it? In yeah. fact, I think it's the greatest score of the lot ever written for the Broadway lyric stage. I, yeah. I think it's. I, I th- it depends if you include. Paulie and Bess, but I think it's of equal stature. Yeah. I really do. Yes. And, you know, I'd be terrified if I had to put a production of Carousel on because it, it's terribly difficult to cast to get the people that you, that you need to really bring everything that that piece demands. Casting is your great thing, if I may say so. You get the casting right, and if you get the casting right, of course, everything falls into place. Now, John, with no expense spared, you and EMI have brought in an operatic superstar for what is now universally known as the football song. Um, oh, thank yeah. you, Liverpool FC. You'll never walk alone from Carousel. Uh, Joyce Di Donato. It's pretty special, isn't it? Do you know... When we started this session, we started with Judas busting out all over, and then I think we did climb every mountain, and we kept this to last because I wanted to push Joyce in certain directions. I'd never met her, and she's a delightful woman and a brilliant artist, but she's one of those great singers who wants to do exactly what you think is best for the material, and she wanted to be pushed in certain directions, Mm. and by the time we got to that number, she was really, really Mm. on fire, and um, she got that sort of quiet determination. Because I think one of the great things about this number, in its context in the show and the film, and it's a mark of the composer's great restraint and integrity, that it remains a dramatic book number. It's not grandstanding at the, at the close. Yeah. They save that for the end of the piece. It has a, doesn't have a loud ending. No, it doesn't. It has a quiet ending, which we've kept. I think it's great to hear it like that. Yeah. Because because everybody tags on this this great ending, which I dare say when we do it in concert as a finale, we're going to have to, you know. But that's an example of John Wilson sticking to to what the song means in the context of the piece. Oh sure, yeah. I'm, I mean, you have to you have to do what the composer wrote. Yeah, always. I've, I mean, that's my my rule for everything. You've got to go back to the source material and get it absolutely right. But Joyce has also got a flexibility that is rare amongst opera singers. She sings Junus busting out all over in an inherently theatrical way, mm. and everything is dictated by the words. June is busting out all over. The ladies, the men are paying court. Lots of ships are kept at anchor just because the captains hanker for the comforts they can only get in port. The moonlight is shining on the shore, and the girls who were contrary with the boys in January are nearly so contrary anymore because it's true. Throughout this album and all of your work with this orchestra, John, with your orchestra, one feels that, that the whole band instinctively knows how the music goes. There's such an innate sense of style now and how to achieve that style. Um, it speaks volumes for your coaching and your instincts, but what factor would you put above all the others that's key to achieving this authentic 
Hollywood sound. Well, as you say, there's no substitute for knowing how the music goes. That's the most important thing. And many of the players in the orchestra know this music. They've seen the films. And more importantly, say Mike Lovett on first trumpet, yeah. Matt Skelton on the drums, they know who the original players were in those Hollywood orchestras. You know, we've spoken to Ewan Raisi, and Matt Skelton is exactly the sort of drums that... Uh, Frank Carlson in Hollywood would have played on. So there are lots of um, enthusiasts in the orchestra. The other thing there's no substitute for is playing together. So I think one of the most important factors is we've been doing it since 1994 and we've been learning as we go. And the sax section has been sitting elbow to elbow for a dozen years. And the same four trumpets, the same four trombones. And it's not a symphony orchestra, it's a hybrid, it's a classical symphony orchestra with a dance band in the middle of it. Mm -hmm. And that combination of sort of a high class theatre orchestra sound with sort of legitimate winds and French horns and strings it is, is, I guess, the thing that the sort of style mm. is right. And all these great characters in the orchestra, they know when they can show off and when they have to pull it back. Yeah, and I do give people you know, free reign when they've got solos to, to, to play their hearts out. I mean, I, people are generally encouraged to play their hearts out. We start from the point of excess, then pare it down. Because then you've got somewhere to go, <laughs> yes. haven't you? Yes, exactly. Most people live on a lonely island Lost in the middle of a foggy sea As I've said uh, always, you're a stickler for getting the casting right, and you always do, but what a great idea here, bringing in Maria Ewing for South Pacific's Valley High, because she is an exotic creature in her own right, and with an extraordinary past. Um, amazing. An amazing woman. I mean, I've known Maria for a long time, and I really love Maria as a person. She's a really wonderful person, and she's had this tremendous career you know work with everyone Bernstein said where's Maria been all my life mm -hmm. you know yeah. um, and she did South Pacific in Birmingham for the BBC yes, I, was, I wasn't I involved was there. I, I didn't see it but I knew she'd done the role and when we were looking for somebody to do Bally High I thought this has to be somebody who's just right the right character you mentioned you know a certain sort of exoticism mm. which Maria has mm. And I just knew in my heart it was the right decision. And, and Maria's been living in America for a while. And, you know, I'm not a soppy guy, but it was an intensely emotional experience seeing her again and working with her again. We were all in floods of tears. Oh, that's, that's and you can hear the intensity with which she sings. Yeah. It's all there. And it's another great example of Roger's understanding how to achieve this exoticism, this mystique in that number, you know, very chromatic, just floaty. The, the melody has its own... I don't know how he does it. I don't it's know how miraculous, he does it. It's miraculous. It is miraculous, but that's talent for you. That's real genius. And aided in this instance, I might say it by Edward Powell's magnificent arrangement for orchestra with Ken Darby doing the choral writing. I don't know who Ken Darby was other than he was Alfred Newman's right-hand man and, and vocal guru at Fox, but he's a bit of an unsung hero. But it is a simply glorious number, and it, it, again, it has that quality of yearning of something just out of reach. Just extraordinary. What will this day be like? I wonder. What will my feelings be. I wonder It could be so exciting To be out in the world To be free